Washington can be sharing with us uh, some of their insights on one of the most interesting questions that's uh, been uh, in the technology and democracy space over the last few years, which is precisely what is the role of digital communication, social media, and so on in the Arab Spring movements the past few years here. Were they trigger revolutions? Uh, what to uh, pick one up maybe ask and actually they'll describe it for you as well. Um, but so we're really lucky to have these folks here today. Briefly by way of bio, uh, so Phil Howard, Associate Professor at the um, University of, uh, of Washington, where he directs the, the, uh, World, the World Information Access Project and uh, the Project on Information Technology and Political Islam, previous author of Digital Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy. And uh, we also have uh, Mr. Hussain here is a doctoral candidate at the, at the University of Washington, where um, he works on information or infra infrastructure and social organization, digital media, and political participation. So with that, we'll turn it over. Um, and then we'll, this will be a, a, an open conversation afterwards. We'll be uh, streaming this on the portal. And uh, hello for those of you out in <coughs> virtual lab. Um, so uh, do come up with some good questions and then talk about them afterwards. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to speak. Um, Chris neglected to mention that I'm actually NDI alumni. I uh, helped out with the NDI addition to Tunisia. I got a big stack of business cards I'll, I'll pass around. Very happy to engage on this stuff after the talk. Um, I know business cards are a little old fashioned, but uh, they don't work if they're sitting in your desk. Okay, so uh, please take one. And we have a stack of books, uh, $15 cash. Typos. Punchline for the book. Um, I'll speak for about 20 minutes. Uh, Muzmil will take over, and then hopefully we can have a good conversation. Because where I'm going to end is not so much with the conclusion of this, uh, the conclusions of this book, but with an argument that's evolved uh, over Twitter and over some blog posts. of whether there are actually any good examples of regimes that are tough to kiddershows and have high technology use, use rates. So that's, uh, that's just a little bit of portion. Um, by the U.S. Institutes of Peace, in part by the National Science Foundation, uh, which issued a rapid grant. Uh, sometimes they're slow moving when it comes to research, research priorities, but they can be very fast with these rapid grants that actually also go out to NGOs or academics. Have a, a question that's um, significant for current events. And my previous research had demonstrated that there seemed to be a relationship between the uh, diffusion of in information technologies and fairly clear, consistent change communication works in many of these countries. So when the Arab Spring happened, this was naturally a, a, a sensible case study for me. Um, spring, 
And what I'm going to argue is that the Arab Spring is a great example not only of how digital media played a key role in the ignition of social protest. So the storyline we will give you is largely one about digital artifacts, right? images of people who've been tormented by security services, abused, abandoned by the state, that actually cascaded across international boundaries and inspired several countries. Um, One of the best ways to, to trigger academic research is through lousy journalism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, right after the spring, uh, the economist did disparities within country, um, a democracy score, a GDP score, the, the size of the youth ball their unemployment rates. And of course, power. So to me, one of the interesting things about the um, digital media in the Arab Spring is that most of the folks who were showing up in those early days of the Arab Spring in each country were a younger generation who had never known any other political system. They had, they had grown up with dictators who'd been in charge ostensibly for 20, 30, 40 years. But somewhere, they learned about political alternatives. Somewhere they connected with others, with a like-minded uh, like birds of a feather, similar attitudes towards the possibilities of political change. And we'd argue that it's digital media. Honest story. Um, <coughs> their index, as they call this an index of fragility, they would say that the thing that caused the Arab Spring um, was primarily perhaps the youth bulge and the length of rule to each authoritarian figure. But the countries for which this solution seems to have the explanatory power are not the ones we think of as good outcomes of the Arab Spring. Right? Yemen, Libya, Syria, these are countries that uh, were locked in civil war, are still locked in civil war, um, basically fell apart, were not re and did not easily recover. The, the classic examples of the good stuff of the Arab Spring are actually Egypt, yeah, Tunisia, some might say Morocco, Jordan. And these are countries not explained by the usual variables in the classical political scientists' model. Uh, what causes what causes social So I go here is to figure out what the modern recipe is. Our question is, what is the modern recipe? That the recipe for contemporary democratization. What might have made some regimes more susceptible to others? To popular uprising, what might have explained the relative success of some movements or others? And this, this is the big picture question, right? And so one of the classical challenges for academic research is that you um, ask a big picture question and then you ask something smaller that you can answer the operation. So I guess this is probably the big picture question, and this is what we ended up doing. I'm going to do two quick minutes on method, because one of the classical ways to approach this democratization question in political science is to take as many cases as you possibly can, possibly even inflating the caseload, right, so you speak of country years instead of just countries. And your instinct, for anyone who's suffered for, through a stats class, right, is to play out the data and imagine a line. Now this is a, a very simple breakdown. Uh, technology diffusion index, internet access, mobile phone penetration. Um, a very basic democracy index from the polity four, right, traditional variables for measuring, evaluating democracies. And our instinct is to look for a, the line, hopefully it goes up if you believe there's a connection between technology diffusion and democratic change. And the work of statistics becomes explaining why no real cases are on the line, and you add in other variables, right, to try to get your explained variation up. Now, it turns out in most of the classical modeling for democracy stuff, it's very rare to get an explained variation of 30 or 40 percent, which means that most of the world's experience with how democracy actually happens is not covered by the things in a traditional political science model. So, our fuzzy logic approach, this is a comparative, new comparative method, is to think of countries as being 
members of a set of theoretically meaningful, in a very grounded way, countries. And in a sense, what we've done is a kind of meta-analysis, because we've taken all the work from country experts who said, yes, digital media made a really big difference to the way civil society organized this year. And we take all of those individual country reports, create our scales, create our gradations from that. Now, my experience is in Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, uh, Tunisia, Egypt. Um, Muslims spent a significant amount of time in Egypt and Tunisia. So we don't have grounded experience in all of these countries. But we've relied on the experts who do have that experience. And this, in its simple down, most parsimonious way, is the solution set that we think has the best, um, best statement of the important causal ingredients for what happened in the Arab Spring. Now, the two most consistent variables that seem to explain the outcomes are the degree to which the population had access to digital media and the degree to which the rulers had access to fuel wealth, right? Basically to buy off elites, um, pay uh, co-opt political leaders, um, opposition leaders, uh, pay for the military. And using this, two, uh, this just simple two-by-two two matrix, we can actually splay out the countries into three sensible packages, right? The group of countries where the dictator was dead or gone after a year, the group of countries where the government had to make some fairly significant concessions um, to take protesters home, the group of countries where there was negligible impact, right, or the regime held its first, its, its, uh, held its hand Elsewhere, and then the group of countries um, that had the nasty breakdown, right, where the military was involved, a severe human rights crackdown, uh, and the state beat up protesters before they had much, uh, much of an impact. Let me turn it now to um, Muzmil, who will say a little bit about the, the traditional arc that we think has come out of this, um, this interesting new pattern of how civil society groups organize. Thanks. Uh, Hello, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to start off uh, telling story, uh, stories about the book, but also stories from the book itself. And we'll start off our first story from Tunis. So in Tunis, uh, there is the main street where all the revolutionary uh, protesters had gathered during the height of the, uh, the, the movements. Uh, and right off of Habib Bourguiba, the main avenue, is, a, is an alley where there's a very popular cafe. Uh, it's colloquially referred to as Facebook Cafe happens to be where a lot of the activists congregate and hang out. And while I was there doing fieldwork, I found two interesting artifacts. Uh, two magazines, both Time magazine. One uh, commemorating uh, us, everyone in the room, and anybody who uses digital media tools as the person of the year. This is 2006. The other item was from after the revolutionary period. Another person of the year, this time the protester, including the Arab Spring protesters, uh, Occupy, as well as many other international movements that seem to have a lot of similarity between uh, uh, since what's happened after the Arab Spring. So I wanted to take a look at, uh, behind the scenes, what's happened to the world in a big macro scale uh, uh, in, uh, perspective in terms of global communication patterns. This is the same 2006 that we all became people of the year. This is 2011, uh, the same year the Arab Spring uh, took root. So I'm just going to play that again just to show the visual kind of difference between the two years. So the world was connected at the time when we all became people of the year, because, and social media uh, and uh, our participatory tools that we all use were being commemorated back then, back then. But in 2011, the reach of these tools exponentially has expanded. So I think this is the backdrop that we need to uh, keep in mind as we refer to the several stories and details coming out from the Arab Spring experience themselves. So there are six major stages that we've observed, and these are pretty um, consistent in across, uh, across the Arab Spring countries that experience protests uh, and uprisings. Number one is the preparation phase. And I would say, uh, we would say that this phase actually begins probably many years before, and we can take 2006 as a, as a uh, point of reference. And so in several of these countries, we saw people using these tools to find each other, to build solidarity, to um, construct social capital between each other in ways that was less possible or less flexible before uh, we could go on to social media uh, and um, digital platforms to, to do it carefully and uh, safely. So there are two kind of ways to look at it. From the user experience, 
we know that uh, even digital, digitally savvy uh, users and activists were also meeting offline to design sophisticated organizational uh, and mobilization strategies. This is from 2008 uh, from Tahrir Square, uh, four of Egypt's most uh, popular uh, and at that time probably infamous uh, bloggers. Uh, but even they had to meet face to face to organize their strategies and then go back to their online platforms to mobilize popular support. The other side of, from uh, compared to the user experience side of the story is the infrastructure side. So in, sa in the same place in Egypt, this is a, a network graphic of Egypt's entire political party uh, system that was online. So online political uh, organizations' uh, ties and how much content they're producing. So the number of spokes refers to how many websites each party had. And the, uh, the, the diameter of, of uh, each cluster refers to how much content they're producing. And the ties between each other tell, uh, show us what it is, which platforms and spaces it is that connect them. Interestingly enough, all major parties uh, that were e even banned uh, at the time, like the Muslim Brotherhood, had a very active presence online. And this was our most significant uh, uh, group uh, that was active just before the Arab Spring, in fact. But they're also being tied together by the tools we're talking about, tools like Facebook and Twitter, but also the ecology of digital platforms. Uh, that are accessible even in several repressive environments. So the, the six year uh, period before these uh, phenomenal movements and uh, patterns of organizing, we can talk about and refer to as a, a general digital lexicon emerging through various everyday uses of uh, digital technologies. Number one, there was an increased level of access to international news so uh, people can of both watch local state uh, media report on public issues and then log on and see what the BBC or the New York Times is reporting about the same phenomenon from abroad and do uh, aspects of fact checking and comparison. Number two, person to person uh, connections are possible even in some of the most repressive environments be because people, whether or not they're aware of the safety concerns and anonymity issues at play, are, we're beginning to use these platforms to connect with each other. Um, uh, we also see a uh, flourishing of online civil societies. So you can think of that map of Egypt's political uh, online political environment as a, a, an illustration of that. And uh, number four is marginalized users, so youth movements, um, uh, feminist movements, uh, and other uh, folks that try to you know uh, uh, remain out of the public eye um, some some of the time are able to find each other in safer, more uh, encouraging uh, uh, um, spaces online, and, and they increasingly did so. Uh, over, over the years, not just during the Arab Spring. And this is why we see so many, we've all seen these images coming from the Arab Spring of Facebook and Twitter graffiti on walls. Uh, so, so this is a, another way to understand why this happened is because these tools become embedded in the day-to-day -day life experience of being a citizen in various countries. So after the long-term preparation phase, we see the ignition phase take off when the protests actually began. And this, uh, in, in all, several cases, there's usually an incident that's ignored by state media and the government or banned to be reported unofficially. Uh, but these stories become public uh, issue uh, and, and uh, public issues even uh, despite the, uh, the censorship uh, on, on state media. And this is because people are sharing these experiences through videos they share through, uh, with each other person to person. And what you find is that within a day sometimes, as happened in Tunis, uh, uh, virtually everyone in major cities knew about the self immolation uh, uh, of uh, Bouziz, Bouziz before state media ever came to report on it. Um, to illustrate the, uh, the overlap of virtual spaces and physical environments, I picked out one of the, the tools that was deployed and tested out in Tahrir Square. This was a, a Turkish youth movement that created a platform for users from around the world to symbolically tweet in and tune in to Tahrir Square on a virtual map, as well as users from on the ground to tweet in and say, I'm actually here as well, and to build a collective voice and a recognition that global attention is being focused, as well as people are doing the hard work of turning out in the streets as well. So when I archived this item, there were already about 3,000 people. Doesn't sound like much, but in terms of the nodes that connect and uh, bring in audiences from around the world, uh, it does uh, uh, increase the reach of, uh, quite, uh, quite a bit. So moving on from that, we have the third uh, tra uh, uh, reoccurring phrase of the, the actual protest taking off on the streets. Uh, but what, uh, the interesting thing here is that people, uh, the decisions that people make and what to take along with them uh, when they turn out to the street. So what we see is uh, mobile phones. Everybody's got a mobile phone. They're documenting their experiences, the abuses that are happening. But they're doing more than that. So these are not just haphazard practices of taking tools along to see what they, 
to do what we do on a daily basis, but also to design strategies to, uh, to make use of those, uh, that content in very strategic ways. So activists were doing DIY self-reporting, but also creating media centers to, uh, uh, to, to, to find more uh, successful ways of having their, uh, increasing their coverage internationally. And this uh, directly connects to the fourth phase of, uh, of uh, pursuing and getting international buy-in. So, so bringing in uh, the eyes and observations of human rights organizations, uh, diaspora networks that exist, for, especially for the Arab world, uh, in several uh, Western democratic countries, but also in, in different parts of the world. And I'll illustrate this through pictures. So you have your DIY citizens, you know, plugging in their mobile phones to laugh posts to make sure that their recording devices are, are on and, and usable. Uh, they're uh, in that moment also uploading this content through to popular uh, YouTube channels and uh, uh, other uh, citizen media portals, which journalists are trolling to, uh, to get the latest coverage from on the ground. So Al Jazeera did a lot more than that, it turns out, in this particular round of events. But, uh, so, so they were in, on the ground as well, but also curating content from social media and citizen reporting actively. And this was being live streamed, not just by Al Jazeera, but several broadcast networks. And you have this really interesting thing where within 24 hours, uh, you have uh, the users who are uploading that content watching from the ground as their reports are being shared around the world and rebroadcasted to them through cable television and broadcast networks that do have a lot more uh, reach and share numbers. Uh, fifth, we uh, move on to a climax phase where at this point, this is usually the first point where several authoritarian <laughs> regimes finally decide to do something about uh, the uses of digital media in the mobilization period. Um, uh, from the user side, you have regimes doing simple but effective things like just harassing, arresting, sometimes torturing uh, um, users uh, who, who are uh, um, using t uh, technologies. This picture actually, the picture on the left comes from <coughs> 2009, but it foreshadows a lot of the uh, what we observed in the Arab Spring itself. This was a student dorm where the regime had broken in during the Green Revolution, destroyed these technologies that uh, students were using. Uh, to report and share their experiences. But on the right, you have the infrastructure side of the story as well. So moving fa uh, fast forward into Egypt, we see the particular point at which, oh, sorry, uh, oh, I can zoom in. Um, you see the particular date on, on the 27th of January where the regime finally uh, realizes it doesn't have a sophisticated way to manage its tools and uh, technologies that uh, consum consumers and citizens are using. So they, the only option they had at that point was to turn off the entire internet. The consequences of which are very illuminating. Number one, uh, there are at least two things we can say about this. First of all, the, the sheer economic cost of turning off the entire internet, so disconnecting your economies as well, for Egypt meant that they lost about 4 to 5 percent of the entire gross domestic product for the year by shutting off the internet. Um, this is an estimate that's been vetted by uh, a few uh, uh, agencies now, so we know that there was a huge economic impact uh, that the regime couldn't sustain for a long period of time. On the other hand was the uh, indirect uh, effect on mobilization itself. So in, uh, particularly in places like Egypt where you have religious institutions and uh, religion as a, uh, a public um, uh, experience, people have a habit of going to Friday prayers regularly in large numbers. So when the regime cut off the internet, people turned to their pre-existing social networks to, and, and ways to find each other. So mobilization actually tends, tended to peak when regimes shut off internet because people uh, uh, resorted to older ways of finding each other, so actually went to the street to find each other. Uh, the, our last uh, trend in, in the six-step kind of six phase of uh, the story about digital media and the Arab Spring is this interesting and complicated post-protest uh, post information war that's happening between the users, between the regimes who uh, have a lot of influence in designing the uh, information infrastructure overall, as well as several solidarity and um, tech savvy support networks that have tuned in from abroad to pay attention to what's happening uh, between these two parties. Um, so what you have is activists are continuing to use digital platforms to document their experiences after the protest period is long ended. So using, uh, continuing to use citizen journalism to document losses that if before the um, diffusion of digital media, a lot of the losses and lessons would have been forgotten in many ways. But now you, you see them archived in public spaces online that other uh, users and uh, movements from around the world are, are tuning into and learning from these lessons. On the regime side, you have regimes going after 
internet ser service providers in very complex legal ways, in technical ways, uh, as well as uh, economic ways of, of buying out uh, ISPs uh, to have more control over them. Um, but the trend, on, uh, one of the things we can learn from the Arab Spring is how this translates to non-authoritarian countries as well. So in going back to the, his, uh, to the history and identifying uh, most, of the, um, uh, most of the known public incidents where regimes have interfered with digital networks, we know that both democracies and authoritarian regimes have been doing this for political reasons. Uh, and they've had a long history of doing it, pretty much since uh, the internet became, uh, uh, was made public by the NSF in 1995. Um, the troubling trend, though, is that uh, these trends skyrocketed when social media, so going back to the beginning part of our story, when we all became people of the year, that's the same year where uh, 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 political interventions with digital networks skyrocketed globally. Uh, but in several democratic countries, that there seems to be a downward curve, but uh, not so much in authoritarian countries. I'm going to hand it back to Phil uh, to finish us up. Uh, <coughs> So um, our argument in that section of the book is that it's, it now makes sense to tell the digital story for almost every stage of the evolution of a, a modern protest. And um, um, Aaron asked me to, to think a little bit about the role of uh, particular technology tools in social protests. So I'm going to put up a... Before the Arab Spring, um, before the Arab Spring, there were several interesting videos about um, that were the best among the best examples of investigative journalism in Tunisia. Um, for a long time, the state had uh, pretty carefully policed what was going on in the media, and so those who wanted to do creative things online had to do their work um, over digital media. And one of the most uh, high impact, embarrassing um, videos coming from Tunisia was this fairly straightforward video made by a guy with awful music and Google Earth. I'll I can turn the music up if you'd rather listen to it, but it's uh, basically this guy with, um, so there are train spotters, right? There are also plane spotters who sit at the end of runways and take pictures of planes taking off and landing. He assembled uh, the records of the Tunisian presidential plane with the flight pattern as reported by uh, Let's see if I can... There we go. It's the I mean, the music, you can play, play it yourself later. Um, basically, it's an assembly of images, stock, uh, photos that these plane spotters took from cities around Europe, demonstrating that the presidential plane was going from Malta to Paris to Rome with one known passenger, the president's wife. And this kind of investigation into the corruption of the regime circulated heavily in the year prior to the uprising. It wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was part of the inciting incident, right? We're pretty sure those are the... The inciting incident is probably the images of Bouazizi li li lying in his bed, burnt, um, bandaged. Um, those images were the digital artifacts that created um, a popular sense that something was wrong and could be done. But in the years prior, there was this investigative work that was done by average citizen journalists. And everything we've said today, I think, should not undermine the fact that each of these countries had long-standing democracy norms. Um, fairly well organized um, groups based in London, based in Toronto, based in LA that were advocating for social change within Tunisia, within Egypt. I would still say that these groups weren't very successful for a long time. They had many important victories, but in the five years prior to the ousting of Mubarak, the biggest protests that actually drew people into the streets were either organized by bloggers or were about the arrest of bloggers. So, Digital media has this sort of longer story. What we're telling is not just a six-month thing right around the moment of organization, but it's actually a longer story of slowly eroding the credibility of corrupt authoritarian regimes. The other thing I'll just put up because I have my Paris thing open is this great shot. Maybe you've seen it um, of uh, the use of drones by protesters. 
by protesters in Poland. So one of the things we argue in the book is that it's a mistake to peg any modern theory of democratic change to a particular technology. You won't catch us talking about Twitter revolutions or Facebook revolutions because it's very difficult to say such and such a software package caused social change. We wouldn't go there. But we would say there's a consistent pattern of democracy advocates and civil society leaders using digital media in creative ways that almost always seems to catch regimes off guard. That is, it's, the civil, it's civil society that tends to be creative and desperate, not authoritarian regimes. They tend to be responsive and reactionary, and sometimes they react quickly, but it's usually a few weeks before they figure out what's going on. And you know, this is not a talk about drones, but everything's about drones these days, so you could go there in Q&A. <laughs> switch back and conclude with um, conclude with a, a punchline that gets to a, a debate I've had um, uh, with this character Evgeny Morozov, you may know, uh, is famous for several arguments uh, and an argumentative style, uh, including an argument that um, it's the too many of us overemphasize the role of technology in contemporary social change. And one of, the, one of the points we've been battling back and forth on is whether or not there are any good examples of authoritarian regimes that are also, uh, that also have a, a high information sophisticated, uh, informationally sophisticated high-tech using population. And I argue that there aren't very many good examples. So I would say that most of the examples of countries where technology has diffused, where consumer electronics have really caught on over the last 10 years, there are either countries that have experienced a rapid democratic transition, like the Arab Spring, or there's been some deepening of democratic institutions. And I can talk a little bit about what the three, the three areas of, um, politi of politics in which I think there's been a big impact. But the latest battle um, concerned this data. I didn't use the fuzzy set thing. I just took several traditional indicators to speak to this question of whether they're good examples of countries that are highly authoritarian and high-tech, and I still say there aren't any. Now, the countries that um, are highly authoritarian that seem to have lots of internet users, relatively lots of internet users or mobile phone users, are, um, include um, uh, Saudi Arabia to some degree, um, Venezuela, uh, and I believe this one's Venezuela. So, if we thought that a, th a regime could be a tough dictatorship and have a, a lot of technology users, we would expect their cases, these are all countries as dots, to pop up in here, right? Negative scores, highly authoritarian, and high technology diffusion rates. But most of the trajectory, if we're going to fit a line, is, is that way. In other words, technology diffusion rates seem to precede a deepening of democratic practices by a few years. In the Arab Spring countries in which we studied in this book, there are three domains of what you might call small p politics that I think are very important. And I'll just run, run them through for you and then conclude. The first thing we noticed is that um, there's a significant amount of evidence that when mobile phones, computers arrive in a household, especially in the Muslim countries we've studied, there is a very significant moment where the family tackles gender politics. In many male-headed house, households, the arrival of new technologies is an occasion to give the eldest son access. Now, this is from a study of um, a dozen countries, a hundred families in, um, followed over several years. To a family, there was a conversation about why the boy gets access to the technologies first, why the time allotment, who gets online first, um, seems to go for the male over the, over the girls. And to a family, they reported that things changed after the year. There was more equity and access over time, and in fact, several families reported that the boys usually lost interest in using technology for anything. So um, that's on a family by family level um, for the ethnographies out there, of the ethnographers out there. The other gender politics thing involves a growing amount of conversation online with mullahs who are not the community mullahs. So very straightforward conversations about 
what love means and cultures where marriages are arranged, things that we don't think of as politics or things that traditional political scientists don't think of as politics are actually very political conversations that are happening in new spaces because digital media makes it possible to connect with somebody who is not your chosen spiritual leader for the community. The other thing is fairly straightforward. International news diets are up. Right? More and more people are getting more and more news from sources other than the state-run source of media. Now, this doesn't mean that they're talking politics all the time, but they are fact-checking. So in Azerbaijan, one of the countries I have some experience with, there's this irregular story that the U.S. is about to bomb Tehran. And we don't know that they're ever about to bomb Tehran, but the Azeri papers cover it just, you know, every few months. The U.S. is coming to Tehran, and the implication is that Baku is next. But the internet is used by students to do their fact checking. Everybody knows it's a false story. The regime does other things for social control online. But I think to a country, we can find more and more people using sources. We may not like them all. It might be Al Jazeera, it might be BBC, it might be CNN or Fox. But we're pretty sure that news diets are more internationalized than they ever have been. So, in the realm of spiritual politics, gender politics, and a news consumption, I know, we know, that there are fairly significant changes afoot. And um, there's other chapters in the book, one on Al Jazeera, one on authoritarian responses, because we know dictators learn. Um, but uh, I think we'd like to open up to Q&A, and, and uh, I, we both know there's a lot of in-country experience in the room, so we'd love to hear if you have a country experience that doesn't play out with what we've argued, or if you'd have a different interpretation of, of the events of the Arab Spring. I'd love to hear that too. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, certainly. It's um, available, not in the sense that I can give you a link right now, but I'll have to, I'm will have happy to put it up and share it with you. Basically, the way fuzzy set logic works is that it takes, um, it privileges a very grounded narrative about what happened in each country, and then looks for the similar conditions that appear in other countries. So there were 16 countries that experienced some kind of um, uh, protest in the central square, and you could tell 16 very different stories, right? You know the outcome, you know the important variables beforehand. But it's an application that basically looks for the parsimonious causes, the things that seem to appear in several cases. And it also lets you figure out um, what is not important. So um, if there was a particular technology or a way of accessing the internet that wasn't relevant, because software spits out those, um, those causes as well. It lets you speak to, to what we call necessary and sufficient causal conditions. And one of the reasons I like it is that it lets us talk with confidence about causality. You, compared to other researchers out there, you'll hear Muzumil and I think using the strongest causal language possible because what we rely on are the anthropologists, the communication scholars, the folks who were there who tell these stories. And often it's protesters, right? And, Muslims even got this figure that of what happened on the day the regime collapsed. Basically, digital disconnecting the internet is now the marker of contemporary regime collapse. And I think um, uh, so. Dictators would say it's relevant too. So yeah, fuzzy set logic, and there's um, uh, a methods conversation at the back of the book that we can talk about. And yes, happy to share the case set. Maybe you can introduce yourself. This is a public event, so there are some folks. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Laura, like Kelly. I'm a building technologist to the American Foundation. Um, so, one of the things that I've been looking at uh, with sort of the couple years past these revolutions online is the failure uh, of the activist street to create recognizable steps forward for governing institutions. And so it's easy for them to be swept aside when, for example, a military institution seems the best to pick up. This happened in Egypt. I think the bigger problem for Americans 
is that the, the institution most capable of sort of just, you know, filtering the signal to the noise for institutional reasons in this country is also the military. It's the DOD. It's the fact that the Congress has funded peer networks of officers for 30 years and hasn't done the same for our civilian institutions. And NBI and IRI can't make up for it. We haven't yet. Um, and this is a fundamental problem for us right now because we contradict this idea of small d democracy because the people most capable of governing uh, end up in uniform. And I don't know if you've run into this, but at the end of the day, unless we deal with this problem of legitimacy and trust in institutions, somehow all themselves for civic life and governance is an ignorant of a very often group. Some of the Egypt, who is the military in this country, was able to call on the internet network from Egypt during the time of their service, but call on Moshe, Levinbar, and the bad guys. And as soon as that scout takes over, that becomes a very wide open problem. They don't do government. This is just, I, I, mean, I don't see this being fixed very well by right now, even though ran into that, there's just a limit there with what all of us can do, at least recognize this as a huge problem. Can you maybe provide some, uh, uh, an interesting story from, from uh, not Tunis, but from a small team in the called Desert. So in Desert, there's a fascinating, um, there's several fascinating projects that uh, it's a city that attracts a lot of young students who usually train in engineering and computer science backgrounds. There's are several science and engineering universities in the area. And, and when I was there in July, uh, there was a, a large uh, meeting happening with uh, several regional hacker activists, so uh, hackers with the, the, several of them with the civic ethos that were creating projects to bring transparency to city-level government. So the problems we're talking about are, are macro level, uh, but they're so, uh, you know, uh, they have so many person-to-person -person kind of dynamics as well, and just the, the narrative you've explained. But I think, you know, uh, with taking an infrastructural approach to digital media, not just an application approach, is, is, is a key move that we should make as observers as, and also as practitioners, because this, this story from Desert is, is a story of bringing uh, governmental transparency by um, quantifying and uh, digitally portraying a city level budget criteria. So that transparency exposes several kind of corrupt practices of where the funds are going, what they're being used for. And this is being done by 22 year old, 25 year old college graduates without jobs, but who have a lot of public level complaints and issues they care about. So, um, so digital media seems to also have a governance level impact, maybe not at the national level as much as we want to see happen, but certainly at city levels and low, more local level governance. I mean, I actually hosted a three-day shindig big event with about 100 people in Silicon Valley on the same topic on this issue of you know, how, how do we support institutional and tech empowered world, right? There is a citizen that have voice, and there is, you know, institutions, governing institutions from local to national that haven't quite figured out how to respond, how to react to that. So I think it's, a, you know, it's an ongoing conversation, I think it's ready to come to the surface of, you know, certainly there were a number of ministers there who are grappling with this very thing, because they're realizing that there are all very old institutions that are becoming unable to deal with the demands, the onslaught of the activity that's happening with the citizenry that has social media at its fingertips, mobile phones, whatever, and you know, it's demanding better services, better governance, accountability, transparency, and you know, it might be still an elite, but you know, it's starting to broaden its impact. And so I think there's, I think we're going to see it just come to the forefront. Governor, uh, that's what it, you know, NYU okay. is dealing with. So I just spent two days at NYU, and this was a huge piece of what does that engagement look like? And, the big themes are we have to start distinguishing between, we saw this actually after Boston too, when does uh, the wisdom of the crowd become the massive identity for a blog, which happened on Reddit. 
um, like this, this real need to distinguish crowdsourcing from uh, curation, filtering, sorting, reputation, credibility. I guess what I worry about most is the fact that in many places, you saw this again, I thought reflected in Boston, is the governing institutions with the most trust and credibility are again in uniform. That, that presents huge problems for a democracy. You should get together. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, the <laughs> I think I think I think you're right. You're you're absolutely right that the the citizen networks that showed up in those first few days of the Arab Spring, the networks didn't become political parties. And I think that's what's happened. So, so most of our story makes sense for that that time right around the spring. But it's, it's pretty clear that there's um, there's a a lot of people need to learn how to make that transition from building a powerful social network to building organized political movement. And I just went back, pulled this back uh, back to this graphic from Lusmil's, um, uh, the point, one of the points was making. This is an image of all the Egyptian key political websites. Uh, and the thing that connects them, it may be able to see it, but the thing that connects them is Western information infrastructure. So there are surprisingly few linkages across political parties. The political parties weren't referring to each other's content, they weren't engaging, they weren't cross-posting, um, they weren't sharing, they weren't even linking to other Egyptian news sources. They were going through WordPress, CNN, Flickr, Facebook, BBC, and Yahoo. Those, those were the, the nodes mediating the flow of content in Egypt. So. Western infrastructure is still providing a significant amount of support, I think, for civil society. And in, there are plenty of countries other than Egypt where I would say um, civic life is highly constrained on the street, but in bloom online, and uh, despite the large military. I'm not so sure about the military in this country. I think there is a lot of good social capital in the military, but there are other researchers who would say that the military isn't getting as much uh, good new social capital used to from ex new recruits. So the U.S. question is harder to actually talk to. Well, I want to feel that you guys work with political parties and yeah. I, um, uh, I was um, in Egypt during the Arab Spring, um, and I was in Egypt for seven years. So I'm not here to do that. But that's another story. Anyway, um, I continue to work in Egypt from here, and we're uh, trying to use technology to continue to engage our partners since we do not have a presence in the country right now. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things we're struggling with too is it's clear that the people who do use the internet are, let's say, for the most part, the elite, the educated, the elite. So my question to you was, I don't know what the comments are, what happens to the poor? Are they, are they excluded from this work way? Democracy, what happens to them? Because in a country like Egypt, that's a big chunk. Sure. So, what, how, what are the ways to reach out to the Arab people? So, um, the traditional way of talking about revolutions is, is to rely on this recipe that we've basically known about since the French Revolution. The, the traditional recipe is that disaffected urban intellectuals leave a capital city, they go to the countryside and radicalize the peasants, and they come back and they take over the government and form a new government. And that's sort of the parsimonious recipe that's supposed to explain all revolutions regarding traditional political science. And I would say that works right up until about the Zapatistas, right? Where a movement figured out how to use digital media in very creative ways to get its agenda onto a political into the international stage. Now, in most of the countries we've studied, the bulk of the population isn't online. But the key thing that's supposed to happen to make a government collapse is elite defection. So those elites are actually really important, right? Because it's when they decide that the, the dictator is no longer worth, um, worth backing. That's when the country actually falls apart. So I would say that the, the, the benefits of having digital access to um, the internet may not be felt through much of Egypt, but the core 5 10 percent who are mostly wealthy elites anyway are, in a sense, also um, opinion leaders. And 
even then, I'd argue, or I'd pitch to Muslim a little bit, but I'd make, I'm so many, there's so many interesting mobile applications now for querying government services, for um, building financial institutions, that I would bet that the, the future of all this is to reach that next segment of the population through mobile tech. Yeah. I think mobile is a major point. One of the points we raise in the book itself is also this question of access. How many folks in a given society have access to several of the phenomena and spaces we're talking about? The answer is usually, as Phil, Phil suggested, um, uh, not not a majority in many countries. But one of the points we, we take a look at carefully is the cost associated with access to digital media, either through mobile phones or even computer networks through public access points like internet cafes. And over the past 10 to 15 years, the amount of daily wages that are required to get access for an hour in a given city like Cairo have dropped radically now in 2012. Um, I forget, do you remember exactly what the statistic was? It was like X dollars per day mm. per hour versus, we can't remember, but uh, it's, it's in the book there. Um, uh, but, but these costs are dropping rapidly as well. I mean, uh, it's, it's usually a trend from the technology development perspective as well, that the costs of producing certain hardwares uh, keep dropping year to year. Um, so, so although most people, there are, there are big segments of societies that are not connected. The reach, especially in urban areas with um, folks who have education but can't apply because economy, economic decisions aren't made properly or appropriately, um, the, the, the reach is exploding in that particular sector. Um, so, so in that case, I think uh, digital media does have a maximizing potential and, and, uh, from that angle. Guys, so um, your uh, democracy back, Jeff Slander, Andrew Sullivan, the ditch. Great. And that's three point one zero. Great. <laughs> you, you pulled some strings. <laughs> Thank you. Another last question. Hi, everybody. I'm the Women's Political Education Team here. Um, you talked a little bit about how uh, Web is offering sort of an alternative public space for marginalized groups like the Mid East. Could you expand a little bit? Um, do you see women using this content in the same ways as men? Is it overcoming barriers that physical public space has? Reproducing those barriers? Um, and also, do you have any gender desegregated data? Because there is not a lot of it out there. Um, uh, uh, the way that we, you know, uh, experience or uh, understood the, the the impact on uh, gender boundaries is is digital media spaces have allowed a space to fulfill that. There's when offline in many religious institutions or political institutions there are clear boundaries that are very hard to cross. Uh, audiences, whether they be youth movements or uh, feminist movements, make maximum use of these spaces because, number one, they are public, but they're not uh, definitively public. These are publicly accessible spaces that uh, members who know about the different blogs and uh, uh, discussion environments can arrive there, hash out ideas, uh, or generally just share experiences and, and have a venting opportunity. Uh, so digital media, for in the long term, uh, has uh, fulfilled, uh, has provided uh, spaces to cultivate um, cultivate linkages, test out strategies, just generally build social capital. Things we see happening even in advanced economic systems like here uh, in, in the US or in Europe. Um, uh, you can think about examples like uh, um, uh, if, if, you know, if you can imagine what it would be like to be a gay student or something in a small village in rural US. I think I would say that kind of experience, having digital access to find like-minded individuals across defeating kind of regional boundaries, uh, what we see in that example is the same thing that's happening with gender movements and youth movements in uh, other developing countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right there. There's not a lot of research on it. And I'd be happy to um, carve out the paragraphs and citations I know about, because um, most of the research that is out there is a single country case study or very deep reports from particular communities or community groups that have used digital media in, in creative ways. Um, and there are a growing number of, initi of initiatives that just seem to catch elites, uh, catch authorities off guard. And they tend to be the, um, the, the they tend to be initiatives that come from young women who know how to, who have the tech savvy to actually collect pictures of police who are being abusive and put them up on us, uh, 
website. It's simply that act of documenting. You know, I think the organizer would say organizers would say is um, uh, is part of the way of processing police harassment in Egypt um, for the victims. The um, yeah, the, there's not a lot of systematic evidence. But one of the things, if I could just go macro for a little bit, and many of you will know these cultures better than I, but. Some of the cultures in the Gulf are um, tea cultures in the sense that a lot of the political discourse, the political decision making happens with men over tea in a specific room. And it may also be that the wives are meeting in the kitchen and also having tea and talking politics. But um, we're seeing more and more movements like uh, the driving mobilizations to drive in Saudi Arabia that, that seem to arise out of um, networks of women who are talking politics but not over tea through one of the traditional ceremonies um, that uh, an emir uh, would prescribe for. So to me, that's what's interesting and hopeful about all this work. But yeah, I'm happy to share the, the little research I know about. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I had a question about your, so one of the things that our president often says is the connection between, or talks about, is the connection between offline and online mobilization organizing. And so, you know, if you look at, you know, the average age in the room is probably around 28, 30, right? And for me too, that distinction doesn't necessarily exist in that same sense. So yes, social media can be used to mobilize people on the street. But it's a very fluid, so for actual protest organizing, it's a useful tool, which is big how to sustain sort of online versus offline delineation, right? You go from the screen to the street. But for the most part, as far as political organizing more generally is concerned, that's kind of a useless distinction that doesn't really make sense anymore in the way that it's sort of been used to, you know, that there's some sort of offline it happens online. It happens on Tuesday. You know, it happens through basically through various forms of digital or social media. So, how do you make sense of that in the book? I know that you talk about it a little bit, but you know, sort of spin this a little bit and and you know, talk to us with what you sense or vision or. I tend you know, to agree with this lack of differentiating between virtual and offline in the sense that in several of the narratives and experiences we document in the book itself you see the direct overlap and in fact a connection between offline and virtual activities so when when we observe from abroad or from you know out of those particular spaces uh, when we when we imagine digital media a lot of the criticism about about slacktivism in fact, have a particular image in mind about what activism means in the digital space which tends to differ widely from actually what activists are doing with digital media in protest mobilization in the sense that the criticism for or the warning about over emphasizing the impact of digital media comes from this image of activism that says people are sitting behind for example Facebook clicking like on various issue pages well activists in several of these countries are doing phenomenally a lot more than just that uh, they are yes they are on Facebook finding each other sharing narratives organizing strategies, but they're also doing it while they're on the ground several times, using whatever con communicative platforms they can tap into. So it's opportunistic, but it's also sophisticated, far more than I think um, popular discourse might have unpacked or given uh, attention to the details in that regard. Um, yeah, one of, the, one of the challenges of doing this kind of research is that you, ha you have to tell big picture stories, and in doing so doesn't privilege the individual activists decisions about whether to go into the streets right so we don't we don't make we aren't able to work with that um, citing that agency but I would say on your question about I agree with you it does make sense to distinguish between online and offline anymore and that is because today the decision the personal decision about whether to face rubber bullets or tear gas is made by people who are getting text messages through friends and family right so they're they're social networks, and it's it's those images of family who've been tormented by security services or abused by the state. Those personal appeals are what drive people into the streets. 
are what make people willing to take on the risks associated with trying to change the government. And I think there was a time when a lot of the information that let people make decisions about whether to participate or not came out over TV. I'm pretty sure now that those appeals to, to join the battle in the streets are digitally mediated and they come from family and friends. So in a sense, they're much more personal than ever before. It doesn't make sense to talk online, offline, or make that distinction. The other question that I had is, pertains to the fact that essentially the public square is now Facebook. Facebook is a corporate entity, right? And we see this actually as a bajan, and I'm looking at you as you work on it. So one of the, so there's two two questions or two sort of related aspects to this. One of it is, okay, so the public square is really public, it's private, right? So there's implications for activists, huge implications. We are literally battling pretty much every day these days with activists or with Facebook for activists in Azerbaijan who are accused of violating terms of service, whose pages are blocked, they're journalists, they reposted something, they probably have violated the terms of service, and they get you know blocked for 24 hours or in, in the case of repeated instances, blocked to a month. Basically robbing them of the platform that they use to move mm -hmm. an agenda, the public agenda, right? So nothing we can do about it, literally, with humans it's sort of blatant hacking and you know um, security forces access. Facebook pages, right? Facebook can actually do something about it. In terms of service violations, they will just rub their, you know, hands clean of it and say, sorry, that person's fault. However, governments hold are routinely sort of pointing that out to Facebook and reporting them for spam, in terms of service violations, other kinds, copyright violations mainly. So, so it's a really interesting dilemma because it's not really a public square, right? There's rules. Abide by the rules, get blocked. So, so how do we deal with the fact that the internet, the public great internet, really is Twitter and Facebook and other private social networks? And then, from a research perspective, particularly Facebook, basically a black box, right? You can do social network analysis, you can, you don't really have access to data, you know, you can't understand even sort of leadership structures. And you can with public pages, but not really because lots of stuff happens through private groups of messages. So, so right, you don't observe in the same way that you can in a public square. How do you deal with that from a research perspective? So there's the activists, they're screwed, and, they <laughs> and the researchers that deal with corporate entities that are they are going to review any of their data. Mm -hmm. I can maybe it's go the other way. I'll start with the research perspective. Um, or the experience of doing research with analytics data, which is held in private uh, spaces. So, so it, it is increasingly difficult to get those. There's a little bit of an academic movement, at least in Europe and the US, uh, trying to address this, trying to um, create a visible discussion, a, a deep discussion about the fact that most social experiences are not happening in private spaces. So we need new protocols and access. Um, I don't know where sort of it's going to go, but the Association for Internet Research has uh, has uh, vocally articulated these issues quite a bit. So we're just now beginning to realize and vocally kind of pursue these things from a research uh, theoretical point of view. Um, Are you meeting with Facebook for Oh, no, sure. no. no I, we found. I, I mean, I personally haven't found Facebook particularly welcoming, but. Um, the Google public policy team has been a little bit more responsive and it seems to be open to uh, sharing data about at least the intervention requests that come in from states. And I think YouTube went through this phase right, where they had the policy, no gore and no uh, hanky panky on the on its channels, but they eventually realized they needed a, an editing team to look at the content coming out of Egypt and Tunisia because it was clearly gory, but there was a public service aspect. Right, just having the content of this. So YouTube went through this situation where they discovered that they have a political role. And I've actually become a, a, a fan of the G Global Network Initiative. And I think Facebook needs to be taught. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine how to force them to allow activists to, to use pseudonyms or to, to stop being so responsive to dictators. But um, 
they're sort of next. They're the next major company that needs to be uh, socialized about the value of having protecting the identity of democracy advocates overseas. I think because we are talking about private spaces, maybe a language to begin with is responsibility to consumers. If we imagine these users, if we're not ready to imagine them as citizens making use of public space, we can at least start with responsibilities to the safety of users and consumers in that sense. And actually, Facebook has been one of these vetted examples that has received a lot of coverage, particularly in Tunis. So when uh, the government went after and shut down various, or, or um, I think actually got passwords and got access to users' accounts on Facebook, Facebook from California responded by using an algorithmic approach to just shut off vast clusters of users, uh, which, was, which was more a brute force kind of method. And really, as, as you were pointing at, uh, disabled some civic activists and leaders from doing their work. So finding better strategies to pay attention to the effect on, on users and consumers, I think, is something that needs to be done. And, and we do see it happening. So in the two years after the Arab Spring kind of winded down, the mobilization at least winded down, we see a lot of international level summits and meetings happening where corporate stakeholders are meeting with uh, 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 export control people, policy experts, to figure out how various consumer tools um, are, are being turned against the consumer base when they're deployed abroad. Um, so we haven't talked much about censorship tools here, but a number of the most successful censorship tools are used here to do blocking of child pornography and violent content, perhaps, but a broader use are just, just turned around to do political censorship. So. There are responsibilities to be shared from many angles, uh, and I think the Arab Spring is also really key to, to give us a very visible and discernible period of time to, to see all of these different angles come out in the public domain. Um, so I think the work is just beginning, uh, but um, yeah, let's see what happens next. Can you, sorry, just last thought on this. What you said is an important reason why we should have many projects that are not platform dependent, and in fact, the diversity of the greater diversity that can be in the digital ecology, the better, because there will come a time where Facebook just clearly isn't the tool of choice for the people who really want to build some change into their country, and Reddit, Reddit may be the next near one. I'm not saying Reddit is going to be the next one, but you know, it, it's going to be, it won't be Twitter or Facebook. Next year it'll be something else, and it might not be Facebook. So you mentioned uh, that there's really no good examples of places that are strongly authoritarian and highly, um, highly high tech. Um, China, probably percentage-wise, is not a super uh, high internet penetration society, just by, but by raw numbers of people online, certainly mm -hmm. one of the big ones out there. Are they uniquely capable of bucking this trend due to their, uh, their financing, tech prowess, and so on, or do you mm -hmm. expect them to be uh, another domino to fall in the not too distant future? I would say they're um, the most likely big exception for now. They are have done s sunk so many resources into building their own internet and their own information infrastructure that um, it's it's in China that it's toughest to learn about international news, it's toughest to get other news from credible sources about what's going on within the country, and we know that there's this um, AQ Khan like network of Chinese technologists who are going out and teaching the Venezuelans and the Cubans and the, and the Iranians how to build their own internet. So there aren't many examples of those distinct ecology, media ecologies. Um, and I think one of the contemporary authoritarian strategies is not so much to hardwire the censorship, but to hire a thousand people to blog for you, right? So. Um, Putin doesn't necessarily want to disconnect the internet, but he'll he'll pay lots of um, nationalist youth to go online and and be of social media, right? That's that's the current authoritarian strategy. So I'll bet we'll see more more of that. I would still say, because I think of myself as a cyber optimist, there are still some really interesting examples in China about how small local movements against um, local corruption or uh, sort of NIMBY environmental activism, activism actually have an impact. And it's, it's, uh, there's a growing number of small cases of voting at the local levels and municipal elections. And uh, the party clearly controls the national conversation. 
but they're either pulling back a bit from the local conversations or they're allowing it or trying to incorporate it. So there's, I would not say China's going to fall. I would say they've got a fairly strong infrastructure, control of the infrastructure. Um, but there are these exciting stories. Just to your point, I've studied women in politics a long time, and it seems to me we're at a point where we need to figure out ways to technology to allow people to be influential without being physically present. And that's one of those beautiful gifts that it does for you. Uh, because women have been so involved in taking the risk of the narrative creation of being on the street to then it being swept aside or being marginalized. And um, I'm wondering in your research, did you find, like, I'm, I'm going to make up a term. A specific sort of citizen journalist role for people who might be sort of super micro validators, where they are really esoteric about something uh, in the next stage, like on criminal justice uh, or the community policing that's being set up. Like these more democratically accountable functions of institutions, that sort of seems to be what the letter left me missing here. Mm -hmm. And that you know that there are people who could perform these. Fact checking, like the people sitting at the airport taking pictures of the planes. There's versions of that for criminal justice. Systems, where we're seeing a lot of the stuff stops being sexy because then it becomes pure bureaucracy and setting up systems that we have to figure out a curriculum basically. And women, I think, have a really important role here. Um, how do you create public processes of accountability over things like security sector reform? Which only people in Washington D.C. knows what this means, right? Yeah. It's police and courts and prisons, and it's the layer that makes up a functioning democracy work over the long term. Mm -hmm. um, but that, to me, is like the next step for where women, especially, mm -hmm. need to go because they they can have permission to be in places sometimes around institutions mm -hmm. where they can't be. They're just culturally not allowed for. And I don't, I don't know, are you seeing that sort of highly evolved role of a citizen journalist attached to institutional evolution happen? Because that is something that I feel like this, Americans actually are very good at this kind of stuff, but we can't be present anymore in a lot of places. The reason really matters for lots of legitimate reasons. But that might be something that even like in the eyes and the IRIs of people start figuring out what, what helpful role, what fact checking, what institutional memory is going missing right now. It's like if we don't figure out these little steps, the big bludgeon institutions will come back. Because mm -hmm. they ain't going to give up easily. Mm -hmm. And then if you make them back, I mean, it's like, do you, like legislatures are another huge mm -hmm. black hole on social media. But actually, how do we how do you use them? That sounds right on that. We Various forms or another. So, you know, I think 
institutionally, organizations may not be there, but a lot of individuals with these organizations are surpassing by far and out smarting and out social media and whatever. They're, the institutions that they're so part of, the institutions are clamoring to kind of catch up, and so parliaments now have to be the guidelines that they just adopted part of the international parliamentary, parliamentarian union. So, you know, they're sort of trying to come up with their own sort of guidelines there. But, you know, does this translate into stronger democratic mm. institutions? I mean, this is our big question. Right? Does, it, does it translate into better democracy? Mm -hmm. I think the, so, maybe, right? I think if you observe, I mean, in whatever, uh, in whichever different countries people in this room are uh, invested in working on projects right now, I would be curious to know uh, about institutions that you see adopting technologies as part of their organizational work. It may not happen a lot, but those moments and those cases are really important because when technologies get embedded into a social system, they change, they have an impact on the social system. So if, if there's an institution that's doing that already, to me that tends to indicate an institution that's ready or flirting with the idea of evolving um, and I will actually point to the Muslim Brotherhood as an example of this. Long before the Arab Spring happened, I observed some, many of the best uses of citizen journalism and do-it-yourself newspapers and blogs popping up coming from the Muslim Brotherhood, Brotherhood which was at that time banned and not, you know, uh, uh, was under severe constraints in Egypt. So it's interesting that this example of the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamization uh, of, uh, of, of the Arab Spring uh, are concerns that people are considering, but at the same time, we shouldn't lose sight of these perhaps fleeting moments of institutional involvement, or which are part of generational shifts as well. So usually, if there's an institution that's ready to adopt a whole sleep of practices associated with technologies, there may be a high chance that there's also a generational shift that thinks differently, has different kind of ideological goals as well. Um, so just that intersection is a key opportunity, even if it doesn't um, stay uh, for the long term. Sorry? So I think one of the assumptions in our work is that the, the ideal democracy, and I, I hope we can leave with our heads on our bodies, the ideal democracy might not be the United States. Right? The, the best instance, so remember, remember the way I did the displayed out the data, the best examples of what a democracy, a technology-enabled democracy might look like for the set of countries that we're interested in might actually be Turkey or Malaysia. And there's, you know, there's different attributes to those democracies we might not like, but rather than setting our comparison points as being Canada, Australia, or the United States, we set them as being regionally, culturally relative. And I would bet that information technologies will allow more countries to figure out what they there, you know, this is phrase democracy with the adjectives. So it's a, every democracy is a something democracy. It's, so every country will f be able to, I think, use digital media to figure out what their cultural variants for democratic institutions will be. And it might mean that their uh, responsive, uh, very responsive security services, but are blind on finance and justice. Or, you know, there, there will be a lot of variations within that. Um, I would say. That for the um, for the set of countries we've studied, there are two things that digital media have um, have done relative on this point of institution building, and that is that um, digital media has allowed a lot more uh, gossip, of course, and the scandal, but also whistleblowing. Right, so whistleblowing is an important part of building in some kind of transparency, and we don't know. There's no, as far as I know, gender balanced research on who's doing the whistleblowing, but we know whistleblowing is relevant. We also know that when um, states collapse, people use digital media to fill in the gaps, to build their own institutions, even if they're just temporary, and even if it's only part of the state that collapses. So for example, um, the banking system in Kenya doesn't serve a lot of the poor, and so there are these local scripts that are essentially digital scripts, trade in uh, mobile phone minutes, that are basically forming this own this small economy through M-Pesa that uh, doesn't rival the banking sector, but it, it does dominate uh, banking for the urban poor. In the Philippines, the justice system is awful, and they regularly convict, uh, convict drug dealers without putting them in jail. 
And so vigilantes have started using digital media, text messaging systems to figure out uh, who should be targeted for justice that has been um, for, for um, murder, basically, that it would be sanctioned by the court system. So the court lets a drug dealer go, the vigilantes text, figure out who to hit, and they, they kill them. So sometimes we speak of governance goods, right? The, the government is supposed to provide many goods. If the state can't provide and in support insti uh, financial institutions that let people save money and barter, people may use mobile phones to fill in the gap. If the justice system can't actually convict somebody and put them in jail, So these aren't great examples, but they're interesting. Yeah. My name is Thomas. I work with our Azerbaijan and our Union programs. Azerbaijan is really interesting. The tech tools, I almost want the country in closer to high authoritarian, high technology use, although I don't know the variable. One thing I've been thinking about is um, kind of the government as we see is really, they look to, our, to the Arab Spring as something they're really afraid of. And one of the claims they made against NDI is that we were trying to foment a Facebook revolution and that we were there to, to do just that via social media. So it seems like they're not only concerned, but they've also adapted uh, their own techniques as such, right? They're using uh, their abilities to, to look on Twitter or Facebook to incriminate people, um, to, to locate activists that they then want to bring in for questioning. So my thing that I've been thinking about is if governments are changing as such because they know that this social media trend is something that's inevitable, how can activists or people that we help adapt to be adapted? Um, I, I guess the reason, the reason is be, because, uh, the evolution is there because I guess the terms of engagement or the, the terms of the conditions of use are always changing. And so our people get very excited about using the tools using Facebook or using Twitter, but then that often gets them caught. It gets used against them. And because it's a space that is so variable, dynamic, and it's not holistically good, sometimes it can be used for bad, and people get scared of they self start self censoring and whatnot. How can the people that we help be on top of the changes that are happening, particularly as governments are particularly interested in changing as well? Um, if I had to pick the most consistent refrain <clears throat> that might characterize the reason why uh, an activist generally might have made use of digital media for political, uh, in political ways before the Arab Spring. Uh, it might sound something like, well, I used it because it was the only space I had and the only place that I thought I could go to and uh, be myself and do things without constant uh, observation or monitoring. After the Arab Spring, I, I would imagine that refrain is going to change to something that first explicitly recognizes that so technologies are socially constructed and some, in many ways politically constructed. And so I think we, we both might, would see, and should see an explicit discussion about the politics of technology, not just the politics of local uh, repression and abuse, abuses, but also the consequences of using tools that are not just there. They came about in a certain specific way. Uh, the way the internet has been deployed and constructed in Saudi Arabia is very different than how it happened in Egypt, which both presented very different opportunities and risks. And I think we are going to see activists both need to, but also are already having an, uh, a very visible uh, awareness of the politics of technologies. And I think that should be the starting point of this evolution you're talking about, because it's too soon. I don't know if it's too soon, but for me, it's too big of a question to ascribe a certain recipe for what should activists, how should they start evolving to governmental decisions at the higher level. Uh, but a, a good step would just be to recognize that tools have political consequence, and they, did, they didn't just arrive haphazardly. They, they arrived through various economic, political, relationships and uh, objectives as well. I think um, I think very it's very important to, to, to have content, right? I think it's all about the content that's in the language of the people who um, to whom it's addressed or to have tools that allow them to produce in their own language and Azerbaijan is um, Unfortunate, and it's, it's one of the few countries, a little like Saudi Arabia, where the government has actively 
actively shaped the culture of internet use. So nothing to do with technology standards, but the Saudis actively involve people in nominating URLs for for being banned uh, from the country, and they've been doing that since the 90s. So it's just it's part of what internet use is. You know that you're that the country is regulating itself, and the Azeris have been very good at uh, demonizing internet use and associating with mental illness and all these other things. And I have this colleague, Katie Pierce, who I'm sure you've met, um, who does great research on that stuff. Um, I think she and I would uh, disagree in that um, the uh, Azeri civil society has, uh, for I think a long time, used YouTube pretty successfully to maintain its identity distinct from a political conversation that's distinct from whatever they're talking about within Aliyev's circles. And um, I remember that they had this one system of uh, recording the national news with the two talking heads that kept spouting the state line, but then doing their own voiceovers, yeah, telling their own stories of national news, putting this on YouTube and calling that the national news for Azeris overseas. And so it's hard to... I mean, I can't think off the cuff of what a specific Azerbaijan program should look like, but I would imagine that either creating the content or giving the tools to let people create content, again, mobile, mobile technologies, is probably the way um, to way to design a program. The other thing I said, I think we talked we talked a little bit about Facebook earlier. Um, if I was to be worried about uh, the next few years, I'd be most interested for policy purposes at mobile phone operators. Right, because I think increasingly mobile phone operators, who owns them, what percent is state control, where the digital switches you know, are physically held, um, and what their policies on being responsive to government intervention on. You know, it's, I think mobile phone operators are, and they're distinct from Facebook, right, which I, I guess is sort of infrastructure and content, but mobile phone. So if there was a way of engaging with the region's mobile phone operators to develop independent conversations, you know, um, because a lot of government bureaucrats have spent some time in the West, uh, or they want their kids to spend time in the West, right, it's for a jury, hire it, and so I think their, um, an active policy agenda would, would start engaging with the mobile phone operators. You're also for the um, industry dialogue and the GNI. Uh, the GNI is a, it's a global network. Um, Right, so she's managed to sign up some European telcos to have that conversation, and I think um, uh, in the absence of it, I'm a fan, uh, and that's partly because there there is no other central place for those kinds of conversations. They are supposed to be in camera, right? So they're they don't they they talk more amongst themselves about the um, requests they get from governments than issue public reports about the intervention requests. But it's really important to have those conversations because, um, you know, uh, because companies otherwise don't do anything or they process things themselves. And uh, I'd rather have some shared collective conversation, uh, even if it's a voluntary association. You know, in my fantasy world, this country would have a privacy commissioner, but you know, that's uh, unlikely. So, you know, in my fantasy world, there would also be some public policy oversight that. But I'm Canadian, so I'm not afraid of public policy oversight. Right? But I think the instinct in this country is to not ask the government to stand in, 
the instinct is to let this industry self-regulate. And this seems to be a good faith effort at self-regulation. We'll see. Hopefully, they won't have too many tests and then fail. We should talk, because we actually did an inventory of telco um, ownership structures. And huh? it would probably be hardest to find one that works. It's very difficult research to do. Yeah. Yeah. They don't like reporting on who owns them. Uh, it's yeah, really it's hard. very difficult. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you.